Welcome back to the All Outdoors Photography Podcast, where we share experiences out in the field and educate others through landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more with photographers from around the world. And today we have Spencer Wood on the show. He's a cityscape and landscape photographer from Columbus, Ohio. So welcome, Spencer. Uh, we've never actually had a cityscape photographer on the show. Uh, so why don't you just go ahead and start off with um, what stories do you intend to tell with your urban landscape images that you capture? All right, then. Thank you very much for uh, having me on today. Really appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, I guess for me is just, you know, I'm a big outdoors person in general. So anytime I can get the opportunity to be outdoors and everything is fantastic. So whether it's landscape photography or cityscape or urban photography, it's, it's all different perspectives and it's pretty amazing for me. Now, for me personally, um, I most like the urban scape or cityscape stuff at night because the colors tend to pop more uh, where you get the nature for, you know, nature colors during the day. Uh, but at night, the city kind of comes alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any, like any particular subjects that you search out for like in that kind of light? Um, so for me, it's usually whether it's sunsets, sunrises, which are you know, kind of typical, type of landscape photographer stuff but just you know capturing those little nuances that you'll see behind the scenes sometimes uh or you know that building that you drive by every single day and you never really pay attention to it uh and then trying to capture some of those things um like you know some of my photography you know here in central ohio is a couple small little towns uh and just be able to go down there and exploring those downtown opportunities to kind of capture a new perspective um, cause you know, at the end of the day, when you get the opportunity to walk around at night or in the middle, middle of the day, if you kind of keep your eyes out and look around, you'll be amazed what you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, for sure. it's definitely like one of those things I think it's important for a photographer to use like multiple like focal lengths and different like compositions and, you know, perspectives really that gets different kinds of images. Yeah. yeah for so me, are you... so good. Oh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask, um, you said you're in central Ohio. So are you in a big city or do you, are, do you, are you just kind of focused on those smaller cities that you mentioned? Uh, so I live, um, just outside of Columbus. Um, so whether I, you know, we'll go downtown in Columbus or in some small towns around Columbus, that's typically where I do most of my stuff. I mean, this is a hobby for me. So, you know, I have a full-time day job. So it kind of limits my ability to get out as much as I might particularly like. You've got to pay the bills and everything. But, um, but you know, and I try to, you know, try to just get out and around and see what, you know, and, and also see some of the parks that we have. And, you know, you think of a lot of parks, you think of like the, the big Hocking Hill parks and uh, mm -hmm. um, slate runs and things like that around here in central Ohio. But there's a lot of really small, almost micro parks, um, either in cities or you know, like really offside the road in the country where you might see some, you know, very unique images and just a very unique opportunity to kind of explore the surroundings and it might be less than an acre but they can be pretty amazing sometimes mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's awesome yeah what, what are some of your like favorite parks around that area that like you may recommend to people because you know columbus being a big city you know the capital of ohio it's like a lot of people travel there is there any like any particular ones that you recommend so um i would say huge fan of walnut woods which you've probably heard about uh here it's just uh over in groveport uh, where you have the tall pines area so that's a pretty amazing park the Scioto mile uh, around downtown columbus so it's actually snakes around the Scioto river right through the middle of downtown columbus is pretty amazing and then also rock mill um, which is down in toward lancaster it's about two or three miles north of rock mill brewery and it's an old gerst mill that basically would grind wheat and stuff like that and it has a huge water mill uh, and that's a pretty amazing place as well. And I would highly recommend visiting that. Unfortunately, right now, uh, the facility is actually closed because of water erosion, kind of eroding away some of the sandstone underneath the foundation. So they closed the actual park right now, but hopefully later on this summer, it'll open up. Uh, and then in the summer, three or four times a year, they'll kind of open up the inside of the mill. So families and people can go and see how the mill used to work. Yeah, that's really cool how, like, parks can incorporate the local history and stuff from the past. I think it's really neat, you know, just coupling that with nature, of course, too. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, and also, if you haven't been to, or any of your listeners haven't been to Slate Run, they have a uh, historical farm 
down here just south of uh, Canal Winchester. And and it has a slight, it's a historical farm from the mid 1800s. Um, so you'll see draft horses and, you know, literally farming as if it was done back in the 1800s. Hmm. Wow. It's a really great opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I've only been to, I think, in the, I'm from Dayton, by the way, but um, in the Columbus area, I've been to like Battelle Darby, like cycling through, and it was quite stunning to be up on those hilltops, just like right over the woodland and everything. Yeah, we're actually really lucky here in Central Ohio with the number of Metro Parks that we have, and a lot of people don't realize the Metro Parks were actually all the way down uh, to Hocking County, which is where um, Hocking Hills state park is at but just adjacent to that there'll be some metro parks down there some metro parks in pickaway county franklin county a little bit of delaware it's actually a pretty nice uh pretty amazing park system or like i said very lucky to have it yeah definitely have you been to the audubon center that's like just outside of columbus because that's yes that is that yeah. is a great place yeah yeah some good boardwalk and stuff out there that, that's a beautiful place yeah and the nature center really is great mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome yeah, do you have any? Do you focus mainly on Columbus in terms of like photographing cityscapes, or do you have like other cities that you may capture there too? Um, I would say Columbus, uh, Canal Winchester, um, kind of those like, canals are in one of those smaller towns. But those are probably my two major focuses, more just because of location um, and the fact that this is a hobby and not a full time full time job for me. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But it's cool because you get to like yeah. capture them in sunrise and sunset and different light, and you know you get to go back to different compositions and try them again and just see how they all interact too. Yeah, absolutely. And probably one of my favorite compositions now is really kind of getting down incredibly low, uh, and you know whether it's you know like, you know photographing a set of train tracks literally at the base of the train tracks. Um, or there was one that I did, it was actually last year, um, where, you know, all those toadstools that you see when mushrooms grow up in your yard uh, in the early spring was actually able to take one, and it was just with my iPhone of all things, and just shoot straight up, right up into the sky, uh, and kind of solve the top, the bottom of the mushroom from below. So kind of giving those wow. unique perspectives. I was just going to ask, for, for some of the beginners in the audience, Spencer, uh, you want to explain real quick, like kind of the effect that produces by getting low with your subject? So for me, it's, you know, just looking at something through a completely different angle uh, and a different perspective. So when, you, when you're getting low, it completely changes the composition. So and I know I uploaded some of the pictures, with, which I think you guys will be sharing here. But, you know, the one of the toadstool and looking straight up, you know, it kind of has this guy in focus. But what I was trying to do with that composition was literally to get the details of under that mushroom toadstool and the little veins and the little little fine details and that thing, but also kind of showing the perspective of you're looking up, you're tall, because this thing is standing incredibly tall. Um, and then there's another one with the train tracks at the sunset where, you know, it's down on the track and it's kind of like taking you out into the horizon. Because I think sometimes when you get down low, it changes that perspective and that composition of those rails going literally into the sunset. And if you're, you know, standing at five foot, six foot, um, it just, it's a totally different look and feel. So I would recommend anyone just get down low, try it. If it doesn't work out. That's fine. Try it again later and, and find that right composition where that's really going to kind of help, uh, help things pop. I think it's, you know, getting low is something that kind of different, like you said, differentiates it from the normal perspective. Um, you know, the common, um, just every day, you know, maybe, walk her around through the city or whatnot. So are there any other techniques like that you'll use to kind of make your images like stand out, like from a, just a, maybe an iPhone image or just a normal perspective? Well, I would say, you know, not only looking from down, you know, getting down low and looking up, but also kind of the opposite, getting from above and looking down. So whether it's, you know, using a, a drone to do that, but you know, sometimes it can literally just be a simple, something as simple as standing on a park bench and shooting straight down or standing on a picnic table and kind of getting that different perspective. Or then also using some of those, you know, foreground elements and kind of bring them more into focus and make them more of the highlight of the composition. Um, have you guys been to, uh, you know, I think it's Town Street Bridge in downtown Columbus and you have those large 
uh, metal gears that kind of overlook the bridge. Mm-hmm. Hmm, I've seen one of those. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've visited there. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. But you know, like one of my compositions doing something a little bit different was actually you stand right behind him because you know he's looking. He's kind of like I kind of call him the guardian of Columbus, and he's looking down the land, down the riverscape, but actually standing behind him and kind of getting his perspective, where he's taken up probably a quarter of the frame. Do you shoot that with like wide angle lens to accentuate that since it's in the, like, I guess the foreground in this case? So that one, my go-to lens is a, a 17 to 75 that I have. And I'm sorry, 17 to 50, my apologies. Um, and that's my go-to lens. And I think that one was actually shot at 17 just to try to get that wider angle. Yeah, it definitely works because you're, of course, incorporating the landscape behind it, which is the city too. So it kind of shows where the subject, in this case, the deer, is you know looking out towards. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know. And again, we all get in ruts and things like that, is is to try something different. So you know, I grew up on a farm. I like spending as much time outside as humanly possible. So you know, my you know my happy place is in a park, uh, out in nature somewhere. But shooting something like you know cityscapes is you know it's a completely different perspective, and it kind of helps hone your craft um, because you know I wouldn't have seen other compositions in nature if I wasn't trying to find those type of compositions in the city. Yeah. Uh, probably a really good one. And, you know, my wife can actually gets credit for the composition on this one is of a little fern with the kind of sun rays kind of shooting it. And that was, again, really down low. I was probably four or five inches off the ground with that particular shot. And it wasn't really, you know, wasn't anything crazy. I think it was actually with an iPhone. Again, it seems like, you know, the best camera you have is the camera you have in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the old adage rings true. Yeah. Do you shoot those with a tripod or do you do like a handheld for those? Um, sometimes they're handheld, sometimes they're tripod. Mm-hmm. Um, like the toadstool, there was no way you can get a tripod or any of that thing. I think it's way too low. Right. Um, train tracks, things like that. Yeah, I'll take a tripod and kind of spread it off the legs or use one of those, you know, almost those micro tripods that Manfrotto makes using one of those. Right, that makes sense. Or yeah, I even recommend people get like a tripod, at least one without a center column, just for this reason. You can get down super low, but still be stabilized too. So yeah, and I've also seen people basically use sandbags too. But, you know, if you're going to have that that tripod, we're going to use your car window as kind of that that tripod mount to kind of help stabilize the shot. You know, I've seen guys use sandbags to do that too. Right, yeah. I've used that for shooting like wildlife outside my car. <laughs> so it works exactly. pr- pretty well, yeah. But that's that's an important thing I think to consider, especially for people that are starting out, because it's like you it don't it doesn't really require any gear to do it. You know, you just really have to think outside the box and be like like you said, stay on a park bench or getting down super low on the ground and like your photographs just change dramatically and you know, for the better really too. Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you edit your photos at all, or is it kind of straight out of the camera? Um, so I would say a lot of my photos are edited, do a little bit of color grading, uh, obviously adjusting the crop and things like that as well. Uh, but no, they're all, I would say that for the most part, they're all edited into one form or another. Mm-hmm. And I typically do a little, your... bit of co- little bit of color grading is really what I do. Oh, cool. So are, with color grading, I'm kind of, kind of a noob to the, like color stuff, so are you like doing is that white balance or are you like individually selecting colors or what's what's kind of your process there um so my process is what i would typically do is i'll pull it into lightroom it's kind of where my photo catalog sits um ironically usually one of the first things i do is that i will go over and edit in photoshop uh, so i'll do most of my edits over in photoshop um you know, where there's adjusting the highlights and the shadows trying to you know pull out those shadows a little bit, tone down those highlights a little while as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll adjust the colors and play with the colors. I might apply a preset. Um, there's some pretty good presets out there. Um, if you ha- if you don't know uh, Matt Kirby, uh, he offers some really fantastic presets. I actually use a couple of his. So they're kind of my, my go-to presets. And then that kind of is my starting point where then I'll adjust everything to taste, depending on the composition and depending on the photograph. So, you know, like if it's going to be something where I want to really bring out the oranges or the reds, I'll, you know, adjust the hue or saturation of the colors a little bit to kind of adjust that. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to push it so far where it starts becoming looking unrealistic. You're like, no, that was not how it looked originally. 
Yeah, I think it's important to, you know, keep it, at least in this case, like a realistic rendition of the scene and not so, I mean, maybe not artistic in like a fantastical way. You know, you want to keep the scene being as how you saw it and what it is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matt Kirby, uh, actually, that's a good segue because uh, I believe you and I met Spencer uh, from the group that he created. It's called the F5 Collab. Uh, would you be able to tell everyone what that is? Yeah, so what it is, it's a group of, you know, I know that you're on it for a while as well, Ryan. It's a group of basically five photographers. Um, and now we're all spread around the U.S. So there's a member who lives in D.C., a couple of us who live in central Ohio, another one who moved out to Colorado. We basically, at the end of the day, we will collaborate on a individual edit. Every one of us has a week that we submit photos for. And then we'll dialogue online with each other. We basically have this large group chat that we're talking back and forth. We'll kind of talk about techniques, crops, and what we're going to do with the picture. And then each of us will take a creative approach to that picture. Um, and pretty much whatever we post goes. So, you know, whether we want to take a whimsical approach where we'll put a a Yeti on a street sign somewhere or a Yeti kind of walked behind a sign or eyeballs on a rock formation or, or something that's going to be a little bit more serious. You know, so, and the whole group, you know, and for me, it's been a great practice for me to really hone my experience and my skills when it comes to editing. As you know, I'm not working on the composition then. I mean, the only thing I'm looking at is that, you know, we get the raw image and then we are all editing it. And it's really helped improve my editing skill set. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's interesting, though, because I've never heard of something like this really like occurring, especially on social media. Like, I'm not sure if Matt, you know, it's his original idea, but it's it's honestly, I remember, I think I was in the group for about two months or so, you know, from the inception of it to just a couple months in, and I was basically dropped out. But it was really cool, and it really, I agree with you, Spencer. It's like, it really helped, like, make me think outside the box and be more creative with, like, post-processing. Um, I don't think I ever tried masking until they joined that group. And I did like this double exposure image uh, with the the raw file that someone else supplied, and then one of my own images. And it was like something else in like grassy. I think it was like a woodland scene. And then I did this. I was actually a mill actually um, here in my town, and I basically just superimposed them together. And it had this like almost like abandoned growth kind of like look to it. It was really neat. So yeah, that's a really fun group to you know just try to create things with. Yeah, and you know, and since we're all spread across the U.S. now, we get opportunities to edit pictures that are different than we would have in our own hometowns. So, you know, we got, you know, a guy who lives in D.C., and he's, we get a lot of D.C. and cityscapes, um, and then another gentleman who's, you know, out in Denver, and, you know, it's out in God's country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just capturing different subjects that way, too. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. So, I'd recommend people maybe start up their own groups and see where it takes them, because it's fun. It's just fun to edit people's photos and see what you all kind of come up with, too. Yeah, and I do know that Matt's always uh, looking for guest members to kind of join occasionally. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's uh, interested, definitely hit up uh, Matt Kirby, and he can uh, we'll get you into the rotation somehow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll leave uh, yeah, awesome. maybe some links down super below. For... Yeah, I think that that's super cool, Spencer. It's a it's a super unique idea. Um, this is kind of a random question here. What is the what's kind of the weirdest edit you've come up with in that group? I know you mentioned the Yeti. Maybe it's that or anything else. What's kind of the weirdest edit you've been able to experiment with with that collab? Probably for me, it has been things like the Yeti. So the Yeti was a little bit unique and different. Um, and ironically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It was it was a fun one. And also some sky replacement, which is something ironically I just haven't done that much of because you know, I'm not a huge fan of sky replacement because sometimes you go, yeah, really, no. That wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, by you know, kind of doing this and being more purposeful, by like, okay, I do want to do a sky replacement because that particular sky is you know, a, little, a little flat. Uh, it's helped improve, again, my editing skills because now I can you know, help match the foreground to the sky replacement background that I'm superimposing in. Yeah, and it's yeah, like that's awesome. if someone supplies like a really, let's say, well, I mean, most raw files by nature are pretty bland at first, but in terms of like color, but like if you do have like a blank gray sky and like you want to give yourself the challenge, you could be like, I'm going to replace that sky to look like a beautiful sunset or whatever. And uh, yeah, yeah, just challenges yourself in that way too. Yeah, and there was one that I, and it was actually my photo that I submitted uh, of one of the train stations um, in Canal Winchester. 
And we actually, you know, again, we all did something different. I was actually able to pull that into Photoshop and do uh, basically made it look like an old vintage photograph. My planes in different layers, some masking, some dodging and burning, and able to actually, I mean, it looks like a old photograph of tears and rips and, and dirt and things like that on. And that was, that was a fun edit. Yeah, definitely. It's like on the inverse of doing realistic edits of like your own photography. It's kind of fun every now and then to do this stuff that's more like the Yeti or something, just like out there and wild. But you know, it's just fun. You know, that's that's how it should be yep. at the end of the day. Yeah. So Spencer, you, uh, I know you said you don't do photography full time per se, but you do have some stock photography and print sales available on your website. Uh, what's, what's been your experiences with those? Oh, uh, I would say. They've been kind of okay, nothing really fantastic or anything, but again, you know, this is a hobby for me, so I put it out there just more as to try different things out. Um, I think right now, stock photography and image sales are so saturated that, you know, because when you can go to Ikea and get something for $2.95 or go to Canva or iStock or something like that and get some stuff, but, you know, it's, it's not quite the opportunities that it used to be, unfortunately. Uh, but I'll say probably my best, my, my best success has been with stock photos. Um, so up on Adobe uh, for the most part. And ironically, Canva. We've, I've actually had a pretty good success on Canva as well. And for the most part, you know, it's enough to buy a cup of coffee. You know, we're not talking about anything. Well, Starbucks coffee. But, you know, nothing <laughs> really crazy or anything. But right. we actually had you know, some decent success there. And, you know, you're kind of like, okay, I wonder who bought that image. You know, that's probably the biggest thing on stock photography. You're like, hmm, I wonder where I'm going to see that image at. I wonder who bought that image. Do you ever get Which, like, unfortunately, you don't see that. Hmm. At least I haven't. Do you ever get contacted by those people like, that buy the images? Like, no. Oh. No, it just you know shows up in your dashboard and Adobe Stock or Canva. Says, oh, someone used your image. Right. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. It's like I have some like artist cooperatives I'm in in my area. It's like sometimes if I'm not sitting in the shop or the gallery... You know, people buy my work, of course, and it's like, I'm wondering, like, where are they from, you know? Where are they putting it? Stuff like that to, like, follow up. It'd be kind of interesting to, you know, hear about those things. Yeah, and the great thing about, you know, the one positive about stock photography is when you upload it up there, I mean, you just kind of just, it sits there. And every couple months, I'll go up and I'll look and see, okay, I wonder how it's sales, and I'm like, wow, okay, I sold, uh, you know, five or six images on Adobe, or I was three or four sales on Canva. I mean, again, it's nothing nothing crazy and I think if I put more effort into it it would be a bigger success yeah it, but it's still congrats on the success you know for what it is because it's like you said it's very saturated and it's like anyone can I don't want to say anyone can do it but it's pretty simple I'd say to just you know upload you can dump your old catalog onto several different you know services and it is like passive income which is nice you know just kind of sits yes. there and uh, unless if it's like newsworthy images that are kind of pertinent or relevant you know it could be just like you said, cityscapes, nature scenes, it could be anything. And those are, for the most part, timeless, and they can be. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you never know, too, that one image, you know, like, I don't know, like a like a, a meteor passes through your landscape or something. You know, <laughs> on a, you know, it may not happen, but you shoot so much, you know, there's a chance it could. And that on a stock site, that could that could go crazy. So. Absolutely. It's good that you're building that base now as well. So. Yeah, definitely. Like recently we had that lunar eclipse that was actually overnight, so that'd be like one such example maybe. Just kind of like oh, a yeah. special event for it, yeah. I was going to ask about the, the stock site. Do you like drag and drop everything into there, or do you look for like like at least kind of like a general category of like images for stock? Um, tend to... I tend to curate stuff, so I don't like to literally toss my entire catalog up there. Um, cause you know, a lot of times I'm like, I'm not going to be happy with that composition or something like that. So I'll, I'll just pull up the ones that I think are going to be relatively relevant. Now I do know people that literally just drag their entire catalog and they pretty much almost back up their Lightroom library up into Adobe stock. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point though. Cause a lot of people, I think, you know, cause stock is kind of like varied and you never know what people may be looking at buying, I guess. Like, so why not? You know, upload a whole hundred different compositions of like the same subject, different focal lengths, different apertures, you know, just whatever really, and just see what people like. And um, kind of like what you touched on there, Henry, it's like, it can matter as in like, it could be years, but like someone may just come across an image and be like, that's perfect. That's the one I need. Um, but it's not going to be, you know, stock's not really going to be such an overnight success. 
just because you you know dump your library or even curate it. Look to your portfolio, and I've seen a good amount of that. So you want to go into how that started there, the drones? So it's I've actually only been flying it for probably six months now. So not a lot of uh, stick time or air time, depending on how you want to phrase it. Um, now. You know, some of the stuff on, you know, on Instagram and things like that, some of that is other people's work, uh, again, as, you know, for the F5 collaboration group. Uh, but most of my stuff has been more experimentation, just trying things different, trying a, a, a you know, different compositions. Um, so, like, for example, F5 was, it was my week last weekend, and there was a cover bridge that was able to take a picture of it. I, you know, bought my camera, brought my tripod, got it all set up, took the picture, and I'm like, you know, the, the, the roadway leading up to the bridge was a little bit on a uh, incline, and it just wasn't happy with the composition. Um, just couldn't really capture the subject the way I wanted to. So pulled out the handy-dandy little drone and put it up 10 feet in the air, 12 feet in the air, not really that high. I was able to get some you know really, really good composition with the covered bridge, or I was able to take it over to Walnut Woods and try to get a very unique composition actually looking down. Uh, which was actually a pretty tricky one to catch because um, right there it was literally right on the edge of the flight restriction zone for Rickerbacker Airport. Um, so you have to get clearance from DGI. You submit, you know, submit authorization for that because uh, you know, the rules are there for a reason. They're pretty strict, and you know those old DGI drones they will not fly in an area you're not supposed to. So getting that composition was a little tricky. Just trying to literally find just the perfect spot. To still stay in the clear and stay legal, but yet actually able to get that really good composition, kind of looking again, looking down directly down below. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Is is there any like like how would you? Because I've flown a drone for a little bit, a little while now, about the same time as you, I think. But like, how do you like look for compositions? Do you just like take it up sometimes for a flight and just look for things, or I mean, is there stuff that like the cover bridge that you're just like set on seeing from that perspective? Um, for me, it's a kind of combination of both. Um. Sometimes it's literally just take it up and fly around and, and see what you can look and see what you can find. Sometimes, you know, I have that, you know, specific composition in mind and I'm trying to find it and trying to find the, the right angle to get that composition. So again, you know, like the bridge, I mean, it just was happenstance. I happened to bring my drone with me because um, that was not going to be my original composition uh, when I was trying to shoot. And, you know, I have a center column on my tripod. I had that center cranked up as high as I could get it and still just not the right composition. So I'm like, well, you know what? Give it a shot. And what's great about these lightweight portable drones, I mean, you can literally pack them in your camera bag and hike out there with pretty much anywhere you want, pop it up and go, yeah, it worked. Well, if it doesn't work, you bring it back and it's, you know, you lost 15 minutes of your time. It really wasn't uh, anything too crazy. Right. Yeah. It's not like a big investment necessarily, but at least you got to fly it and you maybe see a good view from it too. So photograph or not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever like do you ever photograph cityscapes right. with drones? So I've actually done a few cityscapes with drones. Um, now the one problem is since I t try to do most of my cityscape in low light conditions, um, I mean you have to run those usually low and slow. So you know I'll be running at you know let's say f two point eight or f five or something like that, but I'm running at two to three seconds sometimes exposure time and. Um, at least with the little tiny drone I have, the light sensor just isn't good enough to pick up those real little light bubble. Now, I think the more expensive drones are fantastic when it comes to that. So most of my drone shots are more nature focused, uh, just because of more available light at that time. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's like the higher end models probably are better sensors and cameras in there too. But uh, yeah, what kind of model do you use? It's a uh, DJI Mini 2. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good one to start out with. Yeah, and it, it literally is like packs in your bag. I mean, it's pocket size really, and it you know you get that thing up in like a minute or two. Really, it's like oh yeah, I mean it's what two hundred forty nine grams. I mean they're really lightweight and battery life is reasonable. I mean mm -hmm. twenty twenty five minutes battery life. You you can get up, get your shot, get it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Up and down. Yeah. Uh, now I'm curious. This is a shot in the dark kind of question, but like, do you use video at all, or do you share video? Uh, so I haven't shared a lot of video, but I've been shooting some video. So, um, and so while I'll either use it for social, uh, primarily like on reels or something like that. Um, and there's a project I'm going to be working on again, more of a personal project, 
um, just to try to document some work that they're doing at a local football stadium, just trying something different. Again, toss it up, get a different perspective. As they're working with placing the field, kind of do a shoot every single day, see how it comes out. Have you found any challenges kind of switching from video to photo? Not switching. Oh, yeah. Kind of adding that on. Yeah, I, I would say for me, it's probably more kind of engaging my brain to think more uh, along the video sides versus photography. Because again, <clears throat> photography, at least for me, you know, like long exposures, slow, kind of slow things down. Or video, you're not slowing things down. It just is what it is. Uh, I mean, you can slow things down a little bit if you put down some ND filters, you know, kind of tighten the aperture down a little bit, things like that. Um, but it's, you know, it is, it is challenging for me to kind of switch over from uh, photos to video. Yeah. I, mean, and I think it's just a matter of experience. Yeah. Just need some more experience on it. Yeah, that's yeah, perfectly understandable. It's like there's a lot of variables, like, I mean, exposure and composition that are pretty much go hand in hand, but it is like, how do I convey in motion, you know, what's the scene in front of me? Because it's obviously different from a still photograph. Yeah, and if you're wanting to get that more cinematic feel, you know, you got to get your frame rate to be, you know, a, a double of or half of your um, exposure. And, you know, getting that, you know, nailed in just right, you know, there's a lot more combinations that you have to think about. It. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now maybe switching into some of the gear you use besides the drone, like what kind of cameras and other kinds of gear do you use? So I have a ancient, uh, and you know you guys might laugh at me about this one, but it is an ancient um, Canon EOS Rebel T3i. Hmm. This thing is old as dirt, uh, but it it just works. I mean, don't get me wrong. Love to have a nice R5 or a nice Fuji or something like that, but you know this one works, and it uh, works really great for me. And you know, trying not to get into a uh, gear syndrome too much, gear acquisition syndrome. Yes. Um, I have a um, you know fantastic uh, you know camera on uh, 1750 millimeter lens on here. You know it's f 2.8, so it can you know really get some nice depth of field in that one. Uh, and then my other go-to lens is a uh, Canon 85 millimeter prime, and that thing is incredible. That thing, the the sharpness on that one is just just perfect. Mm -hmm. Ironically, most people use it for a portrait lens, but um, Sometimes I'll actually use it to kind of get that, just that right level of almost zoom, for lack of a better phrase, because you're going to shoot 85 millimeters. That's not a landscape lens. You're, you're, you're getting pretty close. Yeah, it's definitely cropping tighter. Yeah, but those Rebel cameras are good, though. I mean, I started with a T3, and, like, I know mirrorless is kind of the way to go nowadays, like you said, with, like, the R5s and stuff. But, I mean, those Rebel cameras are pretty awesome for what they are. And, you know, you can probably get one affordably nowadays still, too. Yeah, I mean, this thing has, you know, all the features that, you know, currently, again, I would love to have, you know, a nice R5 or something like that. But, you know, this little, little thing's a workhorse. I got an extra battery grip on it, so I get have two batteries on the sucker. Um, can shoot, not that I really shoot that much video, but, you know, can shoot 1080, so it's good enough for that. Um, and the other thing that I use a lot, and I've mentioned a few times, is my iPhone. You know, I got the I, iPhone 13 Pro, and it's just the right amount of screen size, but it's not like feeling I'm carrying a tablet around in my pocket. Um, the cameras are fantastic on that thing. And again, you can kind of get, I can get that thing in places where I can't get my, my Canon. There's, there's no way, again, I can shoot that mushroom or something like that from that down low. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I find that HDR too, like, it's it's tempting. You, know, you take a photo with an iPhone that looks better straight out of the camera than a DSLR. Yeah. It's just that, yeah. that Exactly. Auto AI stuff. Yeah. Yeah, my biggest problem is trying to um, trying to get that HDR photo to pull in the Lightroom, right? Because you know it looks fantastic on your phone. You pull in the Lightroom, you're like, where'd it go? It's not, it's not as good anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you, you start to see the noise too. Everything. Yeah. Like yeah. All the degradation of quality probably in the nuances there. Yeah. I mean, do you edit those photos in like Lightroom on mobile, or do you like pull them up on your computer? Say probably about ninety percent of the time I'm pulling it into my computer, hmm. and I have a an, an iMac um, twenty seven inch. So you know you got that nice five K display. So I'll just airdrop it to my computer and pull it up. See it right there, kind of do the edits. Um, I've dabbled a little bit with Lightroom uh, on the computer, but if I want to do really quick edits, and you know I'm not going to be too picky with masking and things like that. I just want to like 
you know, pull up the highlights or drop down the highlights or bump up the shadows, or up blacks or something like that. I'll, I'll just do it right in the iPhone photo app and just edit it right in there. Just do a really quick edit. You know, you might be able to get a little bit of a vignette if you want to, to kind of do a little bit of dodge and burning around the corners to kind of focus on the, the middle of the image a little bit, kind of draw people's eyes in there. But most of my edits I'm doing either in Lightroom or in Photoshop on my computer. Yeah, it's interesting how you keep things kind of like simple with workflow there. Yeah, I mean, you're just basically doing like the basic adjustments and stuff like that. It's nothing that's too heavy handed, at least. But have you ever tried lots of masking before and like those kind of more intensive tools? Yeah, if there's the right the right image that I'm really wanting to pull out the masking, I will. But for most part, at least for my, for my taste and my style, I really don't do a lot of masking. Um, now, what I will do is depending on the the photograph or the composition is I'll try to remove a lot of the distorting items. So there might be a lot of uh, distracting items in the picture. I'll actually try to remove some of those right. just to kind of, you know, kind of simplify the image a little bit. Um, and again, Photoshop has some fantastic tools for that in Lightroom too, both of them do. Mm -hmm. That's like the clone stamp tool, right? Clone stamp tool or just the brush. Uh, or sometimes it'll, I'll highlight the area and say content of work, Bill. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that works pretty well sometimes. I mean, it's it's definitely not guaranteed, but you know, that, that can be super powerful. Mm -hmm. It really is. It really is. Yeah, it's definitely a smart tool. <laughs> you can even, I've never, I've never done this myself, but you can even like, you know, if you're maybe cut off a wing of a bird, you can just, you know, make a pixel, you know, drag uh -huh. up your file, make a, like a blank pixels and then content aware, where fill that I've seen people do that. Yep. I've never done it myself, but mm -hmm. pretty powerful for sure. Yeah. It's amazing what the tools can do these days and you can really stretch them pretty far. So after you've, you've edited an image, um, what's kind of, what do you do next? Do you instantly post that to Instagram? Do you, do you wait a while? Do you put it right on a stock site? Like kind of what's, what's your post post editing workflow there? So I would say what I'll typically do is, Again, it depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm just trying to go out and just shoot some, you know, shoot some, shoot some pictures, do some editing, just to improve my skill sets or, or something like that, um, I'll I'll never post that to Instagram. Never upload it to Soft Photo because you know I'll be taking taking thirty pictures and then maybe like there's like one that I don't like. Um, and then if I do like it, I'm like, hey, I want to pop that up on you know social, whether it's Instagram or something or Twitter or, or that. Um, I'll actually use the business console inside of Facebook of all things. Um, it's Facebook Business Console, which connects up to Instagram. And then what I'll do is I'll upload it in there and then it'll tell me based on my followers and, and my content, when's the best time to post that picture to Instagram or post that reel or video to Instagram. And it'll say, find the optimal time. And sometimes it'll say, that would be really great tomorrow or it'll be great tonight at nine o'clock. And then just let the algorithm kind of go from there, and it'll post it, and then I'll be happy. Yeah, that, is that a wildly different time for like each post, or is that like kind of similar it's, each time? Or? It's very similar. Um, typically, at least for for you know, kind of my tribe, it's right around nine o'clock at night for me. Uh, but it does depend on the day. So if I'll pull, pop it up on a Tuesday, I might give a different time than if I would say let's post that on a Friday. Yeah, I never knew about that. That's super cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing it would just like read the maybe like the usage from like your followers on their apps, maybe, and then just go from there and kind of like create this average. I'm guessing like a median range of like, okay, you're most active at 9 p.m. or something. Um, but I use that same business suite, and that, that's honestly a great tool, and it does help uh, kind of predict trends, I guess, so that we, you know, your photos and your posts get greater reach. So, have you uh, dabbled in any kind of like wildlife photography or anything when you're out in nature? Um, nothing wildlife more is probably because more of the, the quality of the lens that I have, you know, I'm not going to have that really tall photo or, or, or long focal length lens. So, you know, since I'm typically walking around with my camera and I've got, you know, my 17 to 50, you know, unless I pretty much stumble across the deer, I'm not going to really uh, get anything like that. Now I do some, do some backyard photography for the little critters that are at their bird feeders and things like that. Uh, what I need to do is set up a little blind or something back there because shooting through a window just doesn't cut it. 
Yeah. Especially after the cat cat jumps up on the window and gets his paw prints on it and everything. So that's like, nope, <laughs> not going to be posting that one. Right. It's it cute, but no. Makes the images probably a lot softer too, and it's maybe a little bit harder to focus. Maybe just the extra layer of glass. It's quite really in your yeah. way, but uh, yeah, I totally understand that. But yeah, I mean, using a blind though is pretty great. I think. Have you used a blind, Henry? I know I have a few times in my backyard. I tried. I just have terrible patience. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's understandable. But it's it's worth trying out. You know, if that's something you ever want to get more into, I guess. But yeah, for what's yeah, worth. even if it's just even if it's just a simple blind, you know, just a, something really simple, just to kind of shield me and. We could probably get, you know, because we got squirrels, we got a fair number of birds in the backyard, some chipmunks, rabbits, those kind of things. So, you have any, um, you know, maybe new genres or new kind of projects? Or your, I know you mentioned that stadium project, but anything else you're kind of working on in the next couple months of your photography? I would say probably the other thing is plan on doing some uh, pretty good hiking uh, through some of the other trails and, and parks that I haven't visited here in Columbus. So probably documenting some of those. Uh, my wife and I, we keep on talking about doing a trip as well. So depending on where we go for kind of a, a trip, either the summer or in the fall, uh, looking forward to whatever that might be so we can uh, I'll go out and take some pictures while I'm out doing wherever that might be at. Is any... Get some fall color in there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Is there any particular locations you're looking at? Um, so I know California is on the list. Uh, Northern California is just spectacular. It's just absolutely beautiful, especially the further up the coast you get past San Francisco. You have a couple hours, just absolutely incredible. Um, we've talked about a couple of international locations, maybe. We're, a lot of those are still up in the air right now. Um, Smoky Mountains, fantastic national park. I think those are probably, you know, those are the, those are the short list items right now. Yes. Yeah, that's great. If you if you want to try some wildlife at Smoky Mountains, um, Hanaluchi Valley, the elk come you know really close. You can still be safe and be on the road, but even with you know maybe even your eighty five millimeter, you can get some nice shots of the elk with uh, fall color. Um, oh, nice! It's, it's pretty much a guarantee every night. So if you if you end up going there, um, you know, just send me a message. I can I can give you all the cool spots and the details. So. Oh, fantastic! So, no, appreciate that. Place. That sounds great. So do you go to like locations like that with like an open book, like no agenda, or do you like thoroughly plan them out? Like I'm going to hike these trails or I'm going to see this subject. Like what's your process there? For me, for the most part, it's a, Hey, I'm going to go check out this park and bring my camera and see what I find. <laughs> uh, you know, occasionally I'll, you know, be on the park's website and I'll, okay, well, that looks like that would be a pretty nice composition, um, things like that. But for me, it's just about exploring. Just kind of take the camera and, and run and see what uh, see what I happen to stumble upon. Right. Yeah. Just like throw out the map, metaphorically speaking. But yeah, that's, that's a good way to go about it, I think, because it like if you look at too many images online of other people's, whether they're like professional or not, like it kind of distorts your view a little bit. And it's like it's nice to just kind of drop yourself in that setting, like a new unfamiliar place, and just see where it really takes you. Yeah, and even just going, you know, even when you're in the city and walking around. You know, I'll just like, hey, I'm going to go shoot some, you know, some sunrise pictures in Columbus in the morning. And I don't necessarily, I mean, I'll have some general locations. I'll try it down by the river or I'll try it by the state house or something like that. But that's usually about the extent of it. Um, and then sometimes, I mean, we were driving down to Cincinnati area the other day. And I mean, I wish I would have had my camera and I would have been thinking fast enough and pulled up my phone and nothing else. But you know, those, there was a couple of trees on those farm fields uh, down on 71, and the way the fog and the mist was covering them like that would have just been the best composition. Uh, unfortunately, again, no camera. Um, but, you know, just discovering those type of features that you wouldn't, you know, everyday like. You just walk right by sometimes. Right, yeah, just the ever-growing Thank list you know. of, like, compositions and maybe try out in the future even, you know, stuff to kind of work towards. Absolutely. Think you'll ever go back to that location, or oh, you know, like, absolutely. Do you ever go back to compositions you find? Yeah. Oh yeah, so like there have been a couple parks that I'll be to, and I'm like, okay, you know what? This would be really fantastic, and you know, in the morning or you know, a golden hour in the evening. So let, I'll try to work on that composition when I come back um, and, and try to get that better shot. 
a walnut woods, you know, some fantastic park area and you know, some kind of like off the beaten path trails and, you know, we'll kind of discover it and go, oh yeah, I'm coming back tonight to try to get that, you know, to get that shot or I'll try to come back in a couple of weeks or, you know, like you said, you'll be like, okay, this place will be amazing in the fall. It's great, yeah, because it like yeah, especially with cool. staying local like that to your local parks, it like it helps familiarize yourself with them throughout all the seasons too, and that way you can look at like a landscape scene in front of you and go like that's gonna look great in like peak fall color and just different stuff like that. Yeah, and I would even say you know sometimes you know people think well those are the gonna be amazing colors in the winter or these fantastic sunrises you know with all this color you know something I've dabbled in is you know kind of again kind of change that perspective and going more. You know, shooting, obviously shooting color because it's DSLR, but shooting, you know, intentional for those pictures to be in black and white or in grayscale. You know, it's because sometimes doing that in the winter, you know, kind of has a very, has a different feeling to it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. How often do you like convert those to black and white, would you say, for your photography? I'd say 15, 20%. It's a good amount. Yeah. Well, some people yeah, shoot exclusively. Actually, Go ahead. Yeah, and I've been, you know, kind of playing around with, you know, changing my workflow a little bit. I don't, I don't know if it's going to stick or not, but, you know, when I start editing a photo, you know, basically take those saturation sliders and drag them all the way to the left and just basically turn that into a grayscale image. Mm -hmm. Work on the, you know, work on the highlights, the, the, the brightness, the, you know, kind of the blacks and, you know, kind of the, make that image really pop and then bring back the color one channel at a time. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting way to go about it actually. Yeah. I never really considered that. And I don't think, you know, it doesn't work on every picture. Sometimes I'm like, Nope, not going to do that again. Delete, start <laughs> over. What, what images do you find like are better suited for that? I would say a lot of them where there's a lot of contrast okay. between the subjects. Um, so that, you know, contrast between foreground and background, or sometimes when the background will have a, 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 a distracting element in it, that you kind of want to remove that element, but not going so far as to take the clone stamp or to literally remove the element, just to kind of de-emphasize that. So taking that bright green element that your eyes are going to kind of go straight to and just kind of toning that down, dropping the brightness of that. Mm -hmm to really kind of focus the viewer's attention on the subject that you're trying to capture. Yeah. Yeah. No two images should be necessarily edited like the same way because each one kind of lends its strengths to different things you could try out when post-processing. Awesome. Yeah. So as we wrap up the episode here, Spencer, uh, I just want to ask one more question. Uh, how would you describe in a few words what photography means to you? For me, it is almost an escape. So I'm a, I'd like to call myself a recovering IT professional. So, you know, I work with technology every day. And for me, getting photography, it's, you know, about going out, getting some exercise, getting some fresh air, walking around, and just doing something different, doing something on that creative side of things. Because, you know, when you're doing things, I mean, not that technology isn't creative and can't be creative, but, you know, kind of working that side of my brain in, in a more methodical purposeful way that I can kind of, you know, get a different perspective on life, get a different perspective on things. Yeah. It teaches you about yourself and about the world around you and all that stuff too. So yeah, that's awesome. So thanks for coming on tonight, Spencer. Um, where are some of the best places for people to find you? Um, so, work? yeah, so there's a couple different places you can find me. So one is on Instagram. So it's uh, at uh, S P E N C W O O D. So Spence Wood. Um, you can also find me on Twitter as well. Uh, or you can also uh, find me on my website at spencerthephotographer.com. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity, gentlemen.